David Brooks. And he's, uh, I asked him if he wanted to, uh, any uh, AV equipment. No, he said he likes to look, stare us in the eye and get, get our attention rather than using a PowerPoint. So thank you for that. Uh, he's a, he's a speaker, teacher, and coach for former Nordstrom store manager and um, has managed in the corporate world for over 30 years. He uh, lives in uh, Issaquah with his family. He's uh, written a number of books uh, with over 400 gratitude videos posted on YouTube. Thousands have seen his message. And he's now considered a, a leading authority on the subject of getting obtaining happiness in life through gratitude. So, David, you're on. Thank you, Bob. <clears throat> I'm actually going to lay some things here. I speak pretty loud, so hopefully you can hear me. Uh, by show of hands, how many people here have suffered a significant personal loss in your life? It's interesting how I speak to a lot of rotaries. I was talking to Jeff and Petter and... and um, talking about just the, the people I get to speak to. I go to high schools, I do commencement speeches, and I go to rest homes. And so you're talking an age of 18 maybe to mid-90s. Mid-90s, everybody raises their hand. High schools, half the kids raise their hands. Yeah. It's just mind-blowing to me. And I was saying also, I think to Petter, or possibly it was Jeff earlier, about how I'm now doing workshops at Joint Base Lewis-McChord all around gratitude because 22 to 23 service people a day are taking their own life. So we're going to talk about gratitude today and how embracing gratitude can change and impact and in many cases have a significant um, savior effect, if you will. But I'd like to tell you about my significant personal loss. It was, happened to be 16 years ago yesterday. It was a tough day for me yesterday. September 29th, 1998. It's a Tuesday. I woke up and I looked over to my right and uh, see my wife wasn't in bed. That's strange. I wonder where Dana is. Just then, Connor, my four-year-old, comes walking and where's mom? I don't know. Let's go find her. So we walk down the hallway. We look in a couple of rooms. And Kyle, my 14-year-old, comes in. Same things. Where, what's going on? Where's mom? We don't know. We can't find her. So we walk down. We look downstairs. And here's Dana down in front of the washer and dryer. And she's crumpled over. She's all hunched over. And something doesn't look right. So we run down there. And I turn her over. Stuff's coming out of her mouth and things. It just looked terrible. Connor starts crying. I said, Kyle, go call the cops. Call the fire. Call everybody. And within a matter of about five minutes... There must have been 25 people in our house. And they'd had her out on the, the floor, and they had those tubes and wires, and they had those shock things, and the most surrealistic thing I'd ever seen in my life. All I'd ever seen something like that had been on TV. And for those of you that have been through something like this, and I'm always very fortunate afterwards, I have my books and the journals I sell, and people come up and tell me their stories. And some are just really heart-wrenching. But when you've been through something like this, one of the things that you notice is that time loses all measure. And I noticed that within, I didn't know how much time had passed, but they were working on her and I just, I just really didn't pay attention. I was just, I couldn't stop crying and I was trying to console Connor and Kyle. The little fire person comes over to me and says, Mr. Brooke, we've been working on your wife for an hour and a half and we still don't have a heartbeat. You want us to continue? And I just sat there, and I just thought about it for a minute, and I went, um, no, you can stop. And she was dead. And she was 38 years old. And as I mentioned, not only have those of you that have gone down a similar path like this, unfortunately, not only the time, but how you survive. And I realized at some point I was going to have to survive, and I was going to have to get some healthy coping mechanism, not an unhealthy one, Dana had died of a prescription pill overdose. She'd gotten hooked on Vicodin and Oxycontin and all that nasty stuff that you see out there these days. So many people have been impacted by that in some way. But for me, it wasn't just 16 years ago yesterday. That was just the, the, another one in a long list. My father, prominent Seattle attorney, had committed suicide. My mother had died of cancer. A couple of my buddies died the night we graduated from Queen Anne High School back in 68. And it just went on and on and on. And I just started thinking, what am I going to do? And somewhere along the line, I was going to have to figure out some coping mechanism, as I mentioned. 
But a couple days after Dana died, I walked up to the deck on the outside of our house. We lived by Green Lake. And I remember just pinching my skin and thinking, I don't think I can do this. I'm just a human being, flesh and bones. Petter was making a great point about pressure. There's so much pressure in this world that we're in now. I don't think I can do it. And I just sat there by myself. Our house had had friends and family there for several days, bringing food and doing everything that they could. But I just looked out at the sky and I realized for the first time in my life why people kill themselves. All I had to do was walk over to the Aurora Bridge and just jump off the bridge. It's easy. But I thought about it for a few minutes and I thought, nope, I'm not going to do that. Got the four-year-old and the 14-year-old. They've lost their mother, so what, his dad's going to go jump over the bridge? And once you make a decision not to do something, it's now off the table. But it does come back to how you look at something. I'm just convinced it's our attitude. You can go left or right, up or down, happy or sad. Bob was talking about happiness and how we control that. One of my books is called Happiness Starts with Gratitude. I don't know if you can be really truly happy unless you're grateful. But it does depend on how you look at something. So I'd like everybody to stand up if you'd be so kind. And I want you to just take your right arm and just start stretch it out. That was a good breakfast, by the way. Thank you. And start turning it in a clockwise manner. Now, there is a clock back there, but in case anybody is uncertain, here's a, here's a clock face. The high schools have no idea what clockwise is. You know, they're going, we're, we're digital. They have no idea. So they're going, which way am I going? So just do it clockwise, and then just keep it going clockwise. Now, just start bringing it slowly down. Slowly down to your eyes, nose, chin, chest, waist. Now, what direction is it going? Eric, I'm expecting you to get this one. Counterclockwise, thank you. You can sit down. There's always, look at Greg. Greg's like, there's always, I'm blessed enough to have these fraternity brothers I stay in touch with, and I see him every so often, and one of them said to me the other day, you know, we've seen your little presentation, and frankly, we're not that impressed. <laughs> Typical fraternity brother. But he goes, what's the story with this? And I go, well, if you're so impressed, how come you have to ask me about that? I said, it's looking above or below. It's just a mat, it's a glass half full or half empty. So it does come back to how you look at things. And my father, who had killed himself, as I mentioned, was one of these extremely negative people. And I haven't even told you half the other bad stuff that happened to me, because that's enough. But you make a choice. I'd say, good morning, Dad. He'd go, what's good about it? Mm -hmm. And I never understood it. I'd go, God, it's a beautiful day. Because, yeah, the clouds are coming in tomorrow. And, and that's a choice that we make. But I found gratitude along the way. And when I learned how to embrace gratitude, which is obviously the key thing I talk about, it really did transform and change my life. But how gratitude works is very, very important. So I'd like you to all grab a 3 by 5 card that's in the, front of, in the center of the table and grab a pen. Hopefully there's enough pens. We're going to do a very brief little exercise here. I think hopefully, if you don't have any pens, raise your hand. There should be enough cards. And I want you to partner up with somebody that you're sitting next to. Just turn and get a partner. If you have to move chairs, it's just going to take a minute or so. But everybody get a partner. And we're just going to do a little experiment here. And here's what I want you to do. Those that have your partner, upper left-hand side of the card, write, I see you as. I see you as. That's what you're going to write in the upper left-hand corner. And to the right of that, write your partner's name. Does everybody have a partner? Good. Okay, and then down at the bottom, are you up to it, Greg? Are we good? Good job. Yeah, I, I got my name right. <laughs> <laughs> lower, lower right-hand corner, sign your name. Put your name. We'll be the judge of that. We'll be the judge of that. Okay, and I'm going to give you 60 seconds. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to write everything you see as your partner. I want you to look at your partner. I see you as happy. I see you as energetic. I see you as driven. Whatever adjective you have, 60 seconds, go. Write down how you see your partner. No cheating now. <laughs> About 20 seconds. You can write a little as much as you want. Poirier, <laughs> please. You're supposed to be nice. <laughs> 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 
crazy dead or Okay, this table, I'm worried about this table. Okay, stop. Now here's what I want you to do. I'm going to give you another 60 seconds. I want you to both read to each other what you wrote about each other. Go. Yeah, read to each other. But both ways. Both ways. Okay, and stop. So I know you guys can uh, discuss it later, but I'd like you to exchange cards. Give the card to the person that you wrote about. Hand them your card. And so when you look at what that person wrote about you, I heard somebody down here, I see you as energetic, I see you as happy, I see you as different things. When you see that that person has written about you, how many people will probably hang on to that card? Me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been my experience that most people do. The only place I have trouble with this is in high schools because I see them right now and I see you as an idiot. And I go, that's not the concept here. <laughs> So we shouldn't have written that down. <laughs> when I get to talking about this gratitude journal, which I will in about five or ten minutes, the key is what that's doing is that's telling you how you're viewed. I don't understand why we say things to ourselves we'd never say to a friend. I used to use a word to describe myself, I don't even say it anymore, but I can spell it, L-O-S-E-R, and I think, what is up with that? Why would I say that about myself? I wasn't successful, I didn't get the promotion at Nordstrom, whatever it was, it's ridiculous. So when you see how that frames you, how somebody else sees you, one of the things that embracing gratitude and leading a grateful life and being happy, as Bob was talking about, has to do with how you see yourself. And when you see yourself as the way that other person looks at you, that's what writing in a gratitude journal will do every day. So embracing gratitude, first thing I talk about. Second thing I talk about is you just can't give up under any circumstances. Winston Churchill never, ever, ever, ever give up. Three or four evers, I think. And I watched my two sons struggle so much with Dana's death, especially Connor at four. And I struggled. And as I said, I made a decision. I wasn't going to jump off a bridge. But I realized when I was 19 years old, I wanted to be a speaker. Now, I didn't know it was going to be about gratitude or anything, but I just, I wanted to be a speaker. This teacher had invited me back to his classroom, and I went to my car thinking, wow, that was cool. It took me 44 years. I didn't start really professionally speaking until two years ago, and I was managing a Lowe's store, and I quit. And I walked in, and Connor goes, what are you doing home? It's three in the afternoon. And I said, I quit. I'm going to be a speaker. And he goes, well, that's just super, Dad. Did you give And he goes, what are we going to do for food? And I just went, that's okay, Connor. Don't worry about it. Everything will work out fine. But that was a dream for 40 years. Colonel Sanders didn't start KFC till 64. I'll be 65 in January. I don't care. I'm going to do this to 64, 74, 84, 94. I get more passion from this than managing any of those big boxes or anything else I've ever done. I do workshops and women are getting the emotional and talking about their sons, their husbands, their families, giving me hugs. It's the coolest thing. So find your passion somewhere along the way, but don't give up. Connor struggled mightily. They took, I took him, I had to, Dana was gone, I'm trying to raise the kids myself, and I take him to daycare, your son's all messed up. I said, his mom died six months ago. Gosh, I couldn't believe it. And so, well, we need special education. They put him in all these special things, and then I took him in for an assessment one day, and they have him bouncing balls and everything, and he couldn't do it, and he just struggled. And it was tough for all of us, but especially Connor. Then he wanted to play baseball. So you know how baseball starts with coach pitch or tee ball and stuff. He couldn't even hit the ball on the tee, and it doesn't even move. The ball just sits on the tee, and Connor would be swinging up here, and I'd go, Connor, 
the ball. And he's way up here. And he'd finally get down. And one day he hits the tee, the actual tee. The ball dribbles forward. He goes, Dad, I got a hit. And I go, it's, it's not quite the concept, Connor. But he kept trying. Through the years, he'd never played. Being the dugout, I'd go to all the games. I got to be the best dad I can to make up for the fact that Dana was gone. And then one day we get to May 31st, 2005. He's never played, played very little. And it's the bottom of the seven, and it's seven to six, the other team. And there's guys on second and third, and there's two outs. And I think the guy is out of players. So he finally goes, Connor! And he's way over in the dugout. And Connor comes walking out, and he's like swinging the bat like Babe Ruth. He's never even hit the ball, you know, and he's just going crazy. And then he says hi to me, which kids never, Dad, I'm up! And I go, kids never talk to their parents. They know that. But anyway, he gets up to the plate, ball one, ball two, strike one, strike two, strike three. Full count, strike, or strike two rather. Next pitch comes in, he rips it down the third baseline, goes just inside the bag in the left field. That guy comes in from third, the guy from second rounds comes down, here comes the ball, here's the catcher, here's the guy. They all crash at home plate, the guy catches it, and then the ball pops out. And they win the game, eight to seven. And he is standing out on second base, like this, all by himself. Dad, I got a hit! <laughs> and the entire team goes out, puts him on their shoulders, and carries him off the field. I will never forget that as long as I live. When we came home after the lump in my throat was gone after about an hour, I sat down on the bed and I said, Connor, it was never about baseball. It was about the fact that you never quit. You never, ever quit. He had a tough time in school, tough time in sports. And he went on later, he graduated from Bothell High School last year. He was the 3.5 student, and he was the leadoff hitter on the baseball team. And you can't see that very well, but there's his graduation picture. And he's about six foot two, and a phenomenal ball player. But he just never gave up. And I tell people all the time, you just can't give up. I think that's why medication and pills and all this nonsense is it's the way people are trying to cope and things. So you just can't give up. It's just, it's just one of those things you just can't. But, so, Embrace gratitude. Don't give up. Never, ever, ever quit. Third thing, get rid of the crap in your brain. I just cannot get over being out in Bothell. I'd go by those uh, homes, the, the cul-de-sacs and stuff, and those, those three squares that are in front of the house, I believe, are garages. You'd never know it by the amount of stuff that's in there. You know, the garages are open, and it's just floor to ceiling boxes. And then here's this little space, and you can just see this person going like this to walk down to get a box. And I think it's, it's interesting, I believe, as I say, those were meant for cars. I will go to seminars, I'll do workshops, and I'll talk about getting rid of junk, and somebody will raise their hand, you don't understand, I have a knucklehead for an ex-husband. And I go, okay, well, did you get divorced? Yeah, when was that? 1983. And I go, that was 30 years ago. When are you going to stop understanding, you start understanding that it's your life? When you go back in those cars today, notice that the windshield's about two feet deep, it's about four feet wide, and then the rear view mirror is about like this. Probably 200 to 1, something like that. Mostly pay attention to what's in front of you. If you look here and you see flashing blue lights, I get it. You gotta, you gotta pull over. You know, so pay attention a little bit to that, but mostly pay attention to what's in front of you. And it's interesting because, again, I really appreciate Bob. I wasn't expecting him to say this part about happiness. But a lot of people don't know this. When John Lennon was growing up, he was five years old, six years old, I think it was, and his mom said to him, I'm going to tell you the most important thing I'm ever going to tell you in your entire life. Of course, he related the story before he was killed. She said, the number one goal in your life is to be happy. So he goes along in life, and four or five years later, he's in fifth or sixth grade, somewhere in grade school. They're going around the room. What do you want to be when you grow up? So they come to John Lennon, and she says, John Lennon, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he goes, happy. And the teacher looks at him and goes, uh, you don't understand the assignment. And John Lennon looks at the teacher and goes, you don't understand life. <laughs> of course, he was sent home, of course. But it does come down to the attitude that you have, left to right. I had a good friend of mine who was always, um, always supportive to me through the toughest of times. And as I said, I left out a lot of things that were pretty challenging. He says to me one day, you need to get a gratitude journal. Now, how many people here have ever heard of a gratitude journal? Gosh, that's good. A lot of times I used to get zero. Now I get a lot more people. Well, I had not heard of one. And I said, what's a gratitude journal? He goes, it's a little journal you write in every day, everything you're grateful for. So I ordered one from Amazon. It came in and 
I stuck it on the shelf and didn't write in it for a few months. And, and then one day I started writing in it and I noticed all these changes. And then I made my own, the Brooker's Daily Gratitude Journal. And I sell these for $15 and I tell people you can buy mine or a couple of my books or you can get a spiral. I don't care. It takes five minutes a day. And right at the top there's a little quote that says, if you think about it it's like a dream, if you talk about it it inspires you, but if you write about it it empowers you. And I get these kids again in the schools, yeah I like your little journal, do you have an app? You know, and I go. <laughs> <laughs> and actually the funny thing is I do have an app and you just press it, it's the Brooker's Daily Gratitude Journal. I'm so grateful to Bob Guide for inviting me to the Rotary meeting this morning and it, it types it. But it's not the same. There's something visceral about you get a feeling, I'm so grateful, I, where's Jeff? I am so grateful I had a chance to talk to Jeff. When it starts with a thought here, it goes into your heart, your arm, your hand, your pen to the paper, I am so grateful I had a chance to talk to Pet or hear about his story, Jeff, whatever it might be. You can go back and refer to it later. I look back on days that were tough and see how it worked for me and it just makes such a big difference. And so I tell people all the time, if you're focusing, it makes you focus on what you have versus what you don't have. Again, the conversation Petter and I were having about Sweden versus the United States and Seattle versus San Francisco. It's amazing this pressure. I'm a member of Seattle 4 and I go to Rotor every Wednesday and these stories, people always got a little bigger boat than the next person. It just cracks me up. 51, no, mine's 53, I'm 55, I'm 63. You know, it doesn't matter. That's why I love Rotary so much and service above self. And if you want to help yourself, help other people. But it starts with you. And it starts with helping yourself and taking good care of yourself. Now, typically, I do, I don't have much time today. And I always like to be start and finish on time. But I do a little exercise, too, about your daily number. In fact, you know what, we're going to do it real quick. Here's what I want you to do. We're going to sneak this in. Your daily number, 1 to 10. 10 is the best day of your life, 1 is the worst day of your life. Okay? So I want you to think, what's your daily number right now? What number would you pick? You can use, just not, no, you don't have to say it loud. <laughs> but, but, but I just want you to get a number in your mind. And then we're going to do, I can do this real fast without writing. So I'm going to have you raise your hand in a second. So if you're a 1 to 5, I don't want you to raise your hand. I don't want to embarrass anybody who's having a tough day. But how many people here were a 6? Anybody? Okay, 1. How many were seven? Okay, okay, eight. Eight's a good number. Okay, nines. Okay, one, two, three, and tens. Wow, what a fantastic group. One, two, three, four. Okay, here's what I want you to do. This is just for you and no, no talking to your friend. You two, I'm watching you two guys. No, no talking to your friend. I want you to think about what is the number one thing you're most grateful for in your life. Don't share it. I'm not going to give you any hints. Number one thing you're most grateful for in your life. Number one. Okay, so I want you to plant that. I know exactly what it is for me. Now I want you to think, what's the number two most thing you're most grateful for? Okay, so you got one and two. And then the last thing is, it's early, so we won't say today. What was the highlight of your day yesterday? What was the best thing that happened to you yesterday? A lot of times it has to do with family and friends, but I'm, again, I won't give any hints. Okay, so I want you to rethink that. Most grateful for this, second most grateful for that, highlight of your day, those three things. Now I want you to see if that number shifted at all. I think there's only one six. So now by putting that in your brain, think about your life and think about kind of the context that you have. Now how many people here are seven? Okay, Jeff went up one. How many are eights? Okay, I went up a few more. Nines, okay, and tens. One, two, three, four, yeah, a couple little bit, little bump. The idea is when you write this down, I am so grateful for this. The number one thing, actually, let me ask um, Jorge. What's the number one thing you're grateful for? Yeah, a lot. Yeah, health, perfect. That, if, I try not to lead the witness, if I will, but without our health, and who was it? Jeff, was it you and Keith and I were talking about that? I forget, but we were talking about being healthy. Where's Max? Is it Max? I bet you're appreciating health, because I heard about your story, and it makes such a huge, huge difference. And without your health, you really don't have much. So. Embracing gratitude, it takes as long as it takes, never give up, make room for gratitude, get rid of the crud in your brain, and I highly recommend a gratitude journal. But the thing with Dana, with those pills and everything else that happened, everybody's just looking for a way to cope. And so the last thing, and this ties right into Rotary, is sharing gratitude. Because when you get around something you're excited about, see you Keith, 
and, <laughs> and <laughs> you want to share with people. So let me just do another quick example. So by show of hands here, I've been kind of watching people. How many people have been on their smartphone since I've been talking this morning? Anybody? Yeah. So we got one honest person. <laughs> so everybody grab your smartphones. iPhone, smartphone, whatever you got. If you don't have one, that's okay. But if you've got one, pull it out. <laughs> and here's what I want you to do. I want you to, this is called the four T's. You're either going to text, tweet, telephone somebody or tell somebody, so if you don't have a smartphone you can, how grateful you are to have them in your life and I'll give you one minute, go. <laughs> it's just a text. It will, unless it beeps. It's in the car. Oh, that's okay. Okay, and stop, and you can finish those. You can imagine when I do this in the high schools, they've already knocked out about 10 texts. It just blows my mind how fast those little fingers can go. But it is funny, speaking of high schools, I was in a performance uh, auditorium, so it was like the seats went up like this, and there was a lady right over by about that projector, and I could hear. Most people, these were originally designed as telephones, and now, of course, they're texting and all these other many things that they do. But she was actually using it as a telephone. And then I could hear her, and she goes, you know, hi, I'm assuming it was her husband. Hi, honey, I just I want you to know how much I love you, and I'm so grateful for you, and you're just such an important part of my life. She goes, what? I don't know, some speaker just told me to call you and tell you. <laughs> and then people always are so proud, they come over and talk to me afterwards and they go, look at this text. And he goes, yeah, I'm grateful for you too, what do you want? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then there was another one I saw recently and it was, uh, uh, that's great, are you sure you sent this to the right person? <laughs> you know? So, but it's one of those things that, I make such a big point of this and especially around death and destruction and things where it's saved and changed and helped so many lives and helped me. But there's an example, we don't do that enough. I mean, could you ever, that's why I love those little cards. Could somebody ever tell you you're a neat person enough? Could they ever say I'm grateful to Bob for inviting me, for talking to Jeff, for talking to Eric, for whatever it might be. Could you ever hear that enough? You, you've said too much. you said too much. Please don't say anything more. But that's what happens when you frame your life around gratitude. And it has to do with framing, again, everything you have versus what you don't have. But the sharing thing, which is so near and dear to all of us Rotarians' heart, if you want to help yourself, other people, help other people, service above self. I realized how powerful sharing was years ago when I had these same fraternity brothers. And we're all going to go. I, was, I never did drugs, never even smoked dope. I just couldn't do it. But I was an adrenaline guy. And I would just do all this bungee jumping and all these crazy things, so I thought it was thrilling. So I'm going to make an appointment to go skydiving. So I make it with 10 of my fraternity brothers on a Saturday. And then on Monday, a couple of them canceled. And on Tuesday, another one canceled. And then on Wednesday, a couple more called. <coughs> Dave, I think I have a sore throat. I don't think I can make it on Saturday. And so finally, Saturday arrives, and I come walking up to Issaquah skydiving. And I walk to the counter, and I go... Uh, uh, he said, can I help you? And I said, yeah, Brooke, uh, skydiving. And he goes, uh, where are all your friends? And he says, party at 10. And I went, uh, I don't have any. And nobody showed up. And I went by myself. And I have a little picture jumping out of the airplane, a little static line, all that kind of stuff. But um, I was all by myself. Nobody ever got to share that experience. So I will tell you, if you can share what you learn, it's like people that do network marketing. I love those people. They're so enthusiastic and they want to talk to you and share all these things, but it's your business or anything. Sharing it makes such a big difference. But I will tell you that if you get a gratitude journal and you write in this, and by the way, I've got books over there and I've got cards. There's, I've got some cards on the table. I love referrals and so appreciate it. Are you going to draw cards, numbers later? 
cars? I saw yeah, no, no. The, did you guys do cars? <laughs> the little, the little uh, yeah, okay. tickets. Yeah. Did you do the tickets yeah. raffle? Did you buy a ticket? No, but can I give away a book well, for one of those? One right no, I'm going I'm to give away a book. <laughs> anyway, I would give that away later. I will just tell you, in this world, as I mentioned, at Fort Lewis, where these poor soldiers are taking their own lives, I get to impact lives there. I get to speak at churches, schools, all these different places. It makes a difference. And I would urge you, if you heard nothing else I say today, find something you're passionate about in this world. Embrace gratitude and see what it can do for you. It can change and transform a life. I feel... It saved my life. I don't think I'd be here if I hadn't found it. And it can change and save yours as well. Thanks, you guys. So now, we're very grateful for, uh, for you being here. Well, Thank you, Orgy. We appreciate it. Thank you so very much. Very enlightening. Thank you. And we're grateful for, uh, come here, we could tall guy. Uh, imagine Terry Jarvis is there and he's taking a picture of us. Okay. <laughs> and he's going to go, okay? Okay. Wait, wait, wait. wait. We take a picture here. This was made especially for me. I like yeah. this. This is good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you. Sir. Thank you so much. You're sure. welcome. Thank you so much. Do we have a little time for questions? Susan. Yes, Susan. I want to mention that in, in my small business, and some of you might do this too, um, every day in November, November 1 through Thanksgiving, we do daily gratitude gifts. So oh, wonderful. come in and make any purchase, your name goes in a fishbowl drawing, and every day we pick out a winner. Just we want to express to our customers just how grateful we are to them. It's such a small thing, and it just feels so good. Excellent. Great point. Oh, that's also, I will tell you, I do a lot of talks to businesses and chambers, and I talked about the fact that uh, 30 years ago, the top three things employees wanted from an employer, appreciation and recognition, help with personal problems and being in on the know. That's all changed now. Uh, uh, help and appreciation or uh, uh, appreciation and recognition is still number three. Number two is responsibilities. Number one, the runaway hit is purpose. People want to know their purpose. And as much as I spent a long time working for Nordstrom and moved up and was store manager and everything, they did something that was off the charts when you mentioned your customers or employees. And they would bring you up front, okay, David's the store manager of the month, and they bring you up front. There'd be a card, it was signed by the Nordstrom family. There was a $100 bill in it, and then they'd talk about everybody in front of you, and right in the front row was the Nordstrom family. So when you get that kind of appreciation, and again, whether it's customers or employees, it makes a big difference. Well, thank so, you very much. Thank you. Here. So you don't forget the, the test. The test. Thank you. Light up the Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.